Powered is a new IP by the developers of Craftopia, also known as Pocket Pen. In order to 100% powered, we need to capture every single pal in the game, maximize our base to the highest level, beat every single field boss and tower boss in the game, and maximize our own level to the maximum, which is 50. So, join me on my experience in the only game that is actually making Pokemon shake in their boots, and find out just how hard it is to complete the power decks. After deciding on a name for my island, are you serious, my I jumped straight into customizing my character. Personally, I'm someone who spends an awfully long time customizing my character. So I decided to make the only one who could complete this 100% run. Ash, Rizum. Oh, that is also the Riz reference for power, by the way. Three videos in a row. We woke up on the beach and spawned in on the windswept hills. I immediately familiarized myself with the menus and made my way back down to the beach to see if there was anything useful for me. Straight away, I found my first chest and received my first sphere. It's going to be real hard not to call these things Pokeballs. Further down, I find my first journal, which we will also be collecting all of, and found another chest. Made my first workbench. Scrapped a cat. Found an egg. And finally, decided to capture my first power, where I get my first achievement. On the beach where we woke up, I picked up the Lithmunk energy, which we will also not be getting everyone because there's way too many, but we will be maxing out our capturing ability. In addition to that, throughout almost the entirety of my time 100% in this game, I utilized my level ups to increase both my stamina and carry capacity mainly. I did some health, I did some other things, I'm pretty sure here and there, but strictly stamina, carry capacity. Yeah. We add two new paths to our deck. Go back up towards the spawn location and get revealed to the world ahead of us. As soon as we head outside, I find my second journal and continue my exploration. After capturing my second Lambo, I was introduced to the successive capture system in this game. Whilst not too important now, and more so applicable in the later half of the game, every first 10 times of the first times that you capture a pal, you get quite the considerable XP boost. We won't be capturing all 10 for every pal in the game, but it is worthwhile for you to know if you're struggling with later levels and need some XP. Shortly afterwards, I came across my first, I, I don't actually know what these are called, but the fruit trees. These provide fruits that teach your pal certain moves. We won't be making all too much use of these, but they are definitely very useful in the circumstances where you want a specific move on a certain pal. I engaged in a fight with this map hacker and got absolutely baited into thinking I caught it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> We make our way down to this broken temple, where we find another journal, and where I initially had decided I wanted to set up a base. That plan didn't exactly go to plan, but I ended up having an even better idea for where our base should be, and settled down closer towards the Raya Tower. I started to work on my base, and Kativa got considerably pissed at me, because his working conditions were understandably horrible, but he stuck with me through the hard times. Around this time, we also came across a wandering merchant for the first time, but he just, he just had a bunch of blueprints that were far beyond my budget. I also made two beds, for some reason. I ain't got nobody sleeping next to me, bro. I got rid of that shit straight away. I will admit, I was working on my base for a good while. I got it up to base level 5 and aimed to go back out into the wilderness shortly. My general goal right now was to prioritise my exploration first and foremost. As we can see, this map is pretty big, so being able to know where what bus is, where certain materials are, will be massively beneficial to us in the long term. I also, for some reason, didn't make myself clothes yet. On my way out, I also got my second achievement for capturing 10 pals. The sound played, but it didn't show up. But there we go. I also might have died again. Look, let's just, let's just move on. I want to go away. Shortly afterwards, we came across the castle area on the beach, picked up another journal, found this little bridge. There's nothing all too special here, but I thought the bridge was pretty cool, especially with the waterfall. A little while later, I came across this guy. Now, at the time, I was a little bit shook of him, I won't lie. But in actuality, these guys are traders, basically black market traders, selling Pokemon that have been stolen or taken through illegal means. Don't worry, I realise this later, but on this occasion, I didn't talk to him. I get into a fight against like five depressos, I don't believe in and simply take him down with no trouble. For a quick moment, I briefly go back to the base, organise my storage, finally make myself some clothes, but also make a paraglider. This, I mean, needs no explanation, it's a paraglider, but will help us massively in our exploration. Admittedly, this glider right now isn't actually that great. It doesn't go too far and it takes quite a lot of stamina. But for those curious, you can upgrade this to a better glider down the line, which we will be doing. A quick check of the power deck shows us that we're at. So we still have quite a while to go, but we're getting there. I also thought it'd be worthwhile to make a statue of power since we have the necessary resources. This is where you can do two very important things. First, 
Enhance your player's capture chance by using those lift monk energies, but also number two, enhance the stats of your pals using the power cells that you find all over the world. Both incredibly useful things. Almost as useful as this hard for the low bros. My next expedition involved us venturing out towards the north a little bit more. I came across the desolate church, which was very aesthetic, I have to admit, and continued to explore the surrounding area. Of course, catching every new pal I found. I found another black market trader in an abandoned cave, and actually talked to him this time, in addition to finding the nearby settlement. These aforementioned settlements within the game are a little bit lackluster, I've got to be honest. Comparing them to the examples seen throughout a game such as Breath of the Wild, big difference, I know, but... In this game, they feel pretty cosy, and they seem well put together, but I just think there's something that should be there in them. There's nothing really all too much to do in them. Anyway, I continued on to the beachfront, going along the coast, capturing more pals and filling out more of the map, and go up towards uh, this area. I don't know what it's called, but it looks cool. And I came across a very cinematic bridge. I ran into another one of the market traders. God, it's not smiling at me like that, bro. And found the rock. Around this time, I also started to make use of my markers, which I absolutely recommend to those of you out there considering playing this. It just makes your life so much easier. I marked things such as the aforementioned traders, fruit trees, caves, etc. I'll be honest, I didn't know actually whether I was going to make use of any of those things, but it was just good to know where they were. I went back to pick up my items and returned to base. And whilst I was making some developments on my base, I just wanted to mention that from now on, I'll be pretty much cutting out all the times in which we return to base, just to respect your time, because base building can only get so exciting. Unless we make some major developments worthwhile noting, we're going to stick to the main things getting us to that 100%. I briefly went towards the northwest, capturing a few new pals and discovering a few new places. And after petting my lamb ball, I thought it'd be worthwhile to make him a rancher whilst I'm at base. Whilst we're here, another quick check of the power deck shows us that we're at 30 out of 111 captured now. Heading more north, I come across another black market trader, and I don't know whether I was doing something wrong, but I don't think I ever bought anything off these guys. I mean, you guys let me know, but they just didn't have that good of stuff. I also caught my first Relaxosaurus. I mean, he's not he's not that special, but look at him. Around this time, I also started to come across some more dangerous camps. I thought it best to avoid these for the time being. Hey, what? Upon making it further north, I came across this guy. I was way too scared to engage in a fight with him, but this was a very good piece of information. Despite him not being a field boss, this guy seemed very well as if he was one teaching me that there is probably both day and night exclusive bosses, or at least harder enemies which only show up at certain times. What the dog do? After another very cool bridge, we came across both the Bamboo Grove and the Ice Island, where we captured our first real member of the team, Dig Toys. I think that's how you say it. The pals in this game scale tremendously. The ones later in the game are leagues ahead of the ones we're able to capture now. Nevertheless, I also found that this dig toy stayed in my team for a good while, displaying value time and time again. So for those of you playing, I would definitely consider getting a dig toys, not only for the mining capabilities he brings, but also the value on his team. It's like a cool, spiky Blastoise. I also don't know whether I should keep making these comparisons to Pokemon. Fuck it, why not? I upgraded my base to level 10 and messed around with the Statue of Power a little bit just to find out all there is to know about it. Soon after, we took on our first Tower Boss. I kind of forgot we didn't do this one yet, so we're doing it now. These are pretty much the most important fights in the game. The gym fights, if you will. And, for the Raya Tower, our fight is against Zoe and Griswold. Despite being in the introductory area, this one was actually surprisingly difficult. The addition of Dig Toys to our roster was the edge we needed to be able to beat Zoe and conquer the hillside part of our map, where we of course, get our fourth achievement. Throughout pretty much the next entirety of the game, I started to prioritise getting my successive captures out of the way, in order to get my level up as fast as possible. Imagine if Arceus looked as good as this. 
Like I said earlier, my goal right now was just to explore enough so we can have a full map, level up in the process, and know where the different regions are located so we can plan accordingly to our 100% plans. For the next while, we'll be covering ground and leveling up so we can have more confidence in taking on the real barriers to 100%, the bosses and the towers. After making a nice visit to Grintail, I thought I could take him, so I started a fight with him. After beating him down and throwing the spirit at him, he ended up being my 50th power capture, leading me to my fifth achievement. Upon my next visit to the base, I made sure to build my egg incubator, which took me way too long. Afterwards, I returned to the Seabreeze Archipelago and captured more and more powers, being sure to explore all over the archipelago in order to fill out the map as much as possible. After covering a lot of ground, I decided to try and take on one of the two bosses within this area, the branch area. Yeah, I might have died a lot within this one. When looking back, I'm pretty sure I could have beat him, but my confidence was shy, so I continued on with my exploration. I tried my best to manoeuvre my way up this mountain without falling into the hot area, but no matter how hard I tried, I needed to come back when I had heat resistant armour. I also finally made my grappling gun. I explored this interesting area towards the north with some subnautica level ancient alien technology and decided to climb all the way up to the top. For fun. As I got to the top, I did actually find something quite interesting. My level was way too low to take on the grunts at the top, but it did contain four chests and was definitely something to keep in mind and looked like quite an important place for later. Brother, hold on, man, hold on, hold on, man, hold on. Please, please, please. After achieving level 30, I gained the confidence to start tackling some of the field bosses on the map, taking out a pen king, king packer, catchers, sweeper, returning to that branch area from earlier, a bushy, who is such a good samurai, he just disappeared, I also found my very first rare pal. These are basically the shinies, but not shiny, just big. The rare pals in this game, to my knowledge, all come with this lucky trait. So in and of themselves, they're not all too special, but when it comes to breeding, they become very useful as this lucky trait gives plus 15% to work rate and to attack. I also found another one, literally straight afterwards. I'm starting to think they're not that special. But what is special is that I did get my first legendary blueprint for the old bow. Ah! Upon my next return to base, I started to fully embrace the game I'm playing and made a Glock. We ain't playing no more. Something I actually ask of you watching this. If you've played this game, you may have run into this little double hit glitch. At times, whenever I hit an ore with my pickaxe, I sometimes hit it twice. I had no idea how I did this, but if any of you absolute geniuses out there know, please let me know in the comments. The next place up for exploration was the big one. I crafted the heat resistant armor that I needed and took on the volcano. I very quickly found out how hot it was, but I didn't let that stop me. For the next two hours, I explored every inch of that mountain, being sure to get every travel point, and of course, go straight to the top for the tower. This volcano in this game was actually very well crafted, I have to admit. The lava can be a bit finicky at times, especially when on a mount, but the entire time climbing up the mountain, it gives you an incredible sense of scale, all leading up to the final great vista at the top, which I believe is the highest point in the map. If not, we'll come into another one later as well. After I got back, I made myself some metal armor, which I have to admit, is pretty drippy. And another quick check of the deck shows us that we're now at 66 of what I believe I may have mentioned earlier was 111, but I think is more like 137. But we're getting there. The next wall was a lot of successive captures, getting our level up towards the high 30s. Around this time was when I was starting to get successive captures on even the high level powers, such as the Mammarists. After that, I decided to take on the Realm of the Winged Tyrant for the first time too, for a future team member of mine. In addition to the Batelia Realm, after achieving level 37, I also took on my first Elfidran. Uh, I'm usually good with Pokemon names. With some Dragon on Dragon action. What? After my while playing this game so far, I accumulated a lot of pals that consequently were filling out my power box with much needed space. Coming from someone who's played a lot of Pokemon, I thought the procedure was going to be pretty much the same in that I have to individually release every single pal that I didn't want until I realized that I couldn't even release them either. I browsed our unlock technology and came across a butcher knife. I, uh, it had to be done. Except it actually kind of didn't. I realized straight afterwards I could literally just sell them to the black market merchants. I didn't end up wasting too much money and the return was well worth the trip. While spending some time in the desert, I also found back-to-back -back rare fuddlers. Made myself the best pickaxe in the game. Mommy, I don't know what's going on. Hey! Okay. This is basically me just trying to guess where the tree is on the map.
little does this naive GB know we can't access that part of the map currently. Hopefully in the future, but we're not getting to Elysium anytime soon. Since we got the volcano out of the way, I set out to discover the last two regions still undiscovered to us. First of all, towards the northeast into the desert. I also finally made myself a saddle for one of my flying pals to allow me to be able to get across different levels of elevation much easier. This helped me out immensely exploring the upcoming two regions. This was around about the time I found my first stronghold. And yep, I, I did find the hardest one first, but these strongholds contain exclusive powers and training manuals, which allow you to gain additional technology points beyond strictly just the level up. However, as you can see in the middle, it does indicate that my current activity is considered to be criminal. So if you get seen by the troops on the stronghold, they will literally shoot you on site. And they're pretty tough for the level we're currently at. I continue to explore the desert, coming across another black market trader. And gained access to the Dune Shelter, where we're able to get arguably the best accessories in the game, the thermal and heat resistant undershirts, shortly before breaking the game however. At times your base may be invaded by some rogue pals looking for a fight, and a fight they got. I have to admit, my all situation around this time was starting to look very dire. So, after spending some time looking across different videos, I was recommended two very important ideas. First, the best place to gather both ore and coal, and two, the importance of breeding. So, it would be stupid of me not to take advantage of this spot, so I spent the next while creating a mining base to sort out all of my ore and coal needs for the rest of the run, helping us in the process of making spears, weapons and pretty much everything else we'd need to get this 100%. After perfecting that base, I set out to take out pretty much every field boss that was under level 40 on the map. Taking out Univolt, Azure Obe, Relaxorus Lux, Beacon, coupled with another rare pal, Arsox, Warsect, Elizabeth, and took on my first dungeon, about 40 hours deep. But they're pretty fun. I do also have to come clean. I changed the egg incubation time because I was not about to wait an hour for every egg to hatch, especially with the amount of breeding that's coming up. And so, to follow up from my second point earlier, I built myself a breeding ranch and started to breed some very useful pals. Starting out with what I'm pretty sure everyone did, and I knew this, I combined a well-traded celery of mine with a Relaxorus and baked some cake to get a pretty good traded Anubis. Well, a few of them. As I realised I needed some quartz for the next development of my base, I got around to uncovering the final region on our map. The one which also contains the hardest tower in the game. As I was gathering the quartz I needed, I was sure to uncover pretty much all of the snowy region on our map and getting to what I also might believe is the other highest point in the map. I'm not too sure between this and the volcano. As soon as I got back, I built the best production lines in the game, allowing us maximum efficiency when crafting, and continued on to do a couple menial bosses in the meantime which I didn't get around to. Finishing off with the Lunaris, who ends up being our 90th power captured, giving us our final deck related achievement, Season Power Tank. A short while later shows us our last check of the power decks before we complete it, indicating that we're at 91. Around about this point is when we really start to enter the end game. Very quickly, we'll begin to craft the perfect teams, tackle all the remaining bosses, and complete every remaining percent of the game. But why so quickly? Because I found out just how powerful breeding was. It wasn't until I started to try breeding pretty much any and everything I came across where I started to find out exactly how crazy powerful breeding is in this game. I genuinely must have gone through hundreds of cakes. Pause. For reference, whilst doing this process I found myself at level 45. Normally the levels from here would typically go painfully slow, however whilst going through the breeding process, waiting for our pals to have some fun, I was able to get through a lot of successive captures, maybe too many, but that allowed me to reach level 49 by the time I had my team pretty much done, with level 50 soon to be followed. I realised the power I had in my hands, and after finding out all of the combinations I had available to me, admittedly through trial and error, if I was you I'd just look them up, I started to craft what I thought was my best team in the game, excluding Jet Dragon, we get him later. The team that I was intending to take on the future bosses with was comprised of Ozerk, Anubis, Relaxorus for the missile launcher, and Shadow Beef, with our fifth slot of course remaining with Die Howl. 
because he was like my Pikachu. I couldn't get rid of him. With my new team, I also got a few more field bosses out of the way, including Lysander Lux, Verdash, Mamores, Fenglo, Sibylex, Lylene Noct, Wampo Botan, Menesting, Suzaku, Dinosaur Lux, Blazamut, and Anubis, leaving only the big players remaining, which we'll get to very shortly. Just before we tackle the likes of Yormontide, Jedragon, and etc., I thought we haven't done a tower in a while, so with my new team, I travelled to the Free Pal Alliance Tower and took on a new phase. We took down Lily and Lion Lee, conquering the Snowfall region and giving us our 7th achievement. This leaves us in a position with 3 remaining towers and around 30 powers yet to be captured. I thought to leave it quite climactic, I'd leave the 3 towers for a final push towards the 100% and so I tackled all the remaining powers yet to be captured first. I went through the deck one by one capturing and breeding any power we had yet to add to our arsenal, achieving level 50 and also making myself the best equipment in the game in the process. Plus, whilst I was venturing all over the map hunting powers, I continued to work on my Lithmonk energy total and journal completion until I was left in a position where the only remaining powers were connected to the remaining field bosses I'd yet to fight. Yormontide was up first. There's actually two Yormontide bosses on the map, but they're both about as difficult as each other. So we take him down, actually get a really good traded one, so I add him to my team, and continued on to Astagon, who we also deal with, technically. <laughs> Hey, we take those, leaving us with the three level 50 field bosses, Jet Dragon, Frostalion, and the two gods. That leaves us with only the three remaining towers to be completed and with the best pals in the game on my side, I went in more confident than ever. First up was the Brothers of Eternal Pyre Tower where we meet Axel. He had some cool drip but did not stand a chance against our team. We take him down and receive our 8th achievement, Volcano Sovereign. Moving swiftly onto the PIDF tower, I couldn't tell you what that means, but inside Marcus was waiting for us. Once again, I'm sure he was strong, but we were simply on another level. He goes down, giving us our ninth achievement, Desert Sovereign leading us on to our very final challenge. The tower contained within arguably the hardest region in the game, the PAL Genetic Research Tower, where, inside, Gojo Satoru? Okay, it's, it's, it's not Gojo, but inside was Victor, alongside his companion Shadowy. I had no doubt this fight would be hard, even with our team, but we take him on knowing the challenge in store for us. And with that, we receive our final achievement and conquer the hardest challenge this game has to offer. We caught every pal in the game. collected every journal reached level 50 maxed out our capturing ability and obtained every achievement in the game 